Hello and welcome. Glad to see you all here today. Got a few more people we're admitting here. Well, again, welcome to the Oregon Department of Human Service self sufficiency Partners meeting. We do offer ASL and Spanish interpretation. Please use the interpretation icon below to select how you would like to participate in our meeting. We also offer CART transcription services. self sufficiency Programs is committed to developing and deepening our partnerships to provide outstanding and culturally specific services and supports to the people in Oregon. This means listening, learning, and working together across the ODHS programs, state agencies, with the nine tribes of Oregon, community-based organizations, and members of Oregon's communities. This virtual meeting occurs monthly and is a forum for updates, discussion, feedback, and Q&A about self-sufficiency programs and other related subject matter. This meeting is recorded so that we can share the meeting along with the presentations and minutes to those partners who are unable to join us today. The follow-up email and all corresponding documents and links will be sent in one week. At this time, we do ask that you introduce yourself in chat. Please include your name, pronouns, organization, and role, as this is helpful for us and the partners for connection purposes. So I will do that right now. All right, the agenda for today's meeting includes a director's update, partner presentation from Dress for Success, and a presentation from the Oregon Health Authority on health-related social needs, housing-related supports. Um, at this time, I would like to introduce our self-sufficiency programs director, Claire Seguin, and I see that she's on screen right now. So Claire, I'll hand it off to you. Hi, Misha, thank you, and hi, everybody. Um, welcome to a, another month of interesting uh, presentations and conversation together. And that's really kind of where I'm going to be coming from today. Um, I just wanted to take a minute to say that, you know, of course, it's not lost on anyone. There's a lot that's happened since we last met. And, um, you know, we know that, for example, um, the state budget is just getting ready to come out in two weeks, right? So we'll have some sort of a, a sense about what the governor is planning in, in her budget suggestions as we head into a legislative session soon. Um, with a change in administration at the federal level, of course, we can all imagine um, implications of that, especially to some of the programs that we work with. Um, and, you know, along with that, we're not even really sure what's going to happen with the federal budget. In the meantime, um, we don't know whether or not there'll be a continuing resolution. Um, we know that whatever decision is made, I mean, there's potential impacts to our SNAP program, our TANF program, um, you know, the replacement funds for skimming, which is, you know, on, on top of our minds and things like that. And, and the fraud, uh, you know, supports that we've been able to provide to, to families and folks that we serve. And so all of that, I, I think is, um, I'll just speak for myself, is, is creating some, some worry, um, some um, creative thinking, I'll be honest, and my wheels are turning. If this happens, can we do that? You know, and, and what all can we figure out to be, um, you know, to, to do in response to some of the potential changes that might come? And, and you know, um, as challenging as, you know, all this change is, um, I, I feel like we, I mean, this is corny, I admit it, but we've got each other and we have got this shared mission that there is no doubt about we are all committed to no matter what. And I, I just want to be here to tell you that we're with you. We are in it. We are going to do um, whatever it takes to, to keep, you know, keep it on this work that we do no matter what comes at us. And I, I'm really um, grateful 
for knowing that this partnership exists with all of you um, because we're all going to have to get in there together and, you know, figure out what, what the new, um, new situation looks like as it comes at us. You know, there's so many unknowns. We don't really even hardly know how to prepare, but for me, knowing that we've got incredible community partners out there makes me sleep better at night, honestly. And I just wanted to say from me to you that we want to be there um, just as strongly as we can possibly be to support you um, as we're as we're navigating everything together. I'm happy to answer questions. I doubt I have any good answers at this point. <laughs> Lots, um, you know, just feels so up in the air, but um, I'm happy to to hear any feedback or thoughts or if anybody wants to share anything that they're feeling. I know it's um, it's an emotional time. I think we're all feeling tired, probably. I'll just, again, maybe I should only speak for myself. I'm feeling a little tired, um, but but committed, absolutely committed to our work. Yeah, so much related to the um, to the refugee world. Oh my goodness! Yeah. All right, so we don't need to talk about anything. I want you to know. I've said this before, but I sincerely mean it. I am at the other end of a phone, at the other end of an email, at the other end of a message. For anybody who thinks I can help in any way, or if you think I need to know something, let me know. We will also commit to, you know, transparent communication when we learn anything um, that we think is important to you all. I mean, I think Misha's just been doing an amazing job of sending out information, and we'll just we'll just continue with that that commitment as soon as we learn um, anything that we think is helpful. Looks like I Julia have, has something. Oh, great. Yeah, I have a quick question for you. Thank you for your encouraging thoughts. And I think a lot of us are feeling quite similar in our own uh, places of work and in our institutions of, um, I'm at the University of Oregon. And I, I guess I just wonder if there are any thoughts or things that we can do to kind of um, plan for Oregon being something of a sanctuary state and that it's possible a lot of people might move here and how do we plan for an increase in um, our population when we already feel like we're pretty strapped with um, you know maybe not having enough people to do the work that's already being done. I so appreciate that question, the thinking around that. Um, I will, I can only just share with you sort of right this minute what, what is happening and it's not very satisfying yet, but there are some um, conversations being scheduled. I know on my calendar in particular about some of the refugee, you know, um, kinds of questions. Um, others meetings are being uh, set up to talk more about the broader population potential um, risks and all of that. But what I can um, share with you right now is that I will dig a little deeper to find out exactly what maybe the broader strategy is, not just the SSP kind of related strategy, um, and see if I can't get some information for Misha to share back with you. I don't know of a formal plan at this point. I'm not aware of one. Doesn't mean there isn't one. It just means that SSP director doesn't know it yet. You know, so I'll I'll push and I'll I'll ask some questions to see what I can um, find out for you, and then and then loop y'all in. All right, thank you, Claire. I don't see any other hands or comments in the chat right now. Thanks, Misha. Yeah. Um, before we uh, move to our next presentation, uh, just because it came to mind as Claire was speaking about me sending information out, I wanted to apologize to you all. I sent out 2025 invites for the meetings and um, my listserv went a little crazy. Um, I, it wasn't me sending repetitive emails, I promise you. It's the listserv. Um, there are some safety features if you email so many people. 
on the same day. And so it has held some emails back. And I think that what happened was Outlook sent 12 individual invitations to external parties. And so all 12 got held back and it's trying to send one every few days. And that's why that's happened. I'm going in and canceling them so that you don't get inundated um, with all of these um, emails. But if you do, if they do come by, because they're auto sending when I'm unaware, um, you can delete them. Uh, I have not made any changes. Uh, if you have accepted it once, you should be good to go. So I do apologize for that. I'll have to consider a different way of sending next time so it doesn't happen again. Uh, all right. With that said, I know we have our next presenter here. So um, Kiyomi, are you ready for your presentation? Hi, everyone. Yes, I am. Um, so my presentation today, I'm just going to go over our member agency orientation just as a refresher. It shouldn't take that long and I'll have answer any questions after. Am I able to share on my end? Correct. I can hit the little share button and you I'll should be it. able to. Yeah. Okay, Let me know if that doesn't work. All right. Here we go. And then we're going to present here. And we do see your screen, so we're you good. see, is it nice and big? And it says member agency orientation on it. Yep, looks good. Great. All right. So everybody, welcome. Thank you for being here and uh, having me present today. Um, and I'm hoping the outcome is to answer any questions about how to refer and who to refer to our program here at DRESS. So just to base on our mission statement, uh, our mission statement here is to empower women to achieve economic independence by providing a network of support, professional attire, and development tools to help them thrive in the work and in life. Um, this is just a little bit about us. I won't read through every, um, every slide deck, but I will put it in the chat at the end if you want to go through um, and read all of it to yourself. All right, um, who we serve and what we offer. We do support women. It says non-binary, but we have changed that recently. I do need to update my slide deck to gender expansive. Um, so what that means is uh, our focus is women and any funny, anybody who identifies as women non-binary, um, that's who we want those referrals from. Uh, we do offer clothing. Uh, we offer clothing, job search support and workshops, as well as a job retention program. Um, how it works is all of our, our, all of our member agencies, they do have to go through a member agency orientation that's held once a month virtually. And I'll put the link in for this month's member agency orientation as well, just in case somebody wants to go through this PowerPoint with me again on Monday. <laughs> um, all right, the clothing appointments, we do give two separate clothing appointments. The first one is going to be to help women uh, feel confident or women, gender expensive people feel confident in their interview. Um, so the first one is to support the interviewing process. And then the second one, we do offer them a second clothing appointment to support the job that they have found once they find that job. All right. So we do, uh, as I mentioned, we do offer some workshops as far as some pre-employment workshops. Um, sorry, let me go back one. Uh, and those are are anybody's able to join those without a referral. Um, and then once they attend a workshop, if a participant attends a workshop, they then are able to do what we call a self-referral um, where they're, they don't have to go through a member agency to, to come in and get clothing for interviews. Our job retention program. So once they find a job, we give them the second clothing appointment and then we invite them to PWG which is a lifelong program that we have here at Dress for Success. It's also nationwide. So if they move from here and go to another state that has a dress, they can then uh, go into the PWG uh, there. But we have different, uh, we do financial literacy, health, professional development, leadership. And these are just some of the things um, that we offer in our once a month meetings that we have. Um, these are some of our program results. And then this is our workshop. So our job seeker workshops, we do have them uh, virtually as well as in person. Wednesday, we do a drop-in workshop uh, where they can sign up for 30 minutes uh, time for 
to have a HR professional help them with resumes, cover letters, interviewing, job search, all um, and those type of things. And then we also offer the same um, the same thing on virtually. Um, and this is our career center website where everybody can. This is where. Uh, everybody can find information about our job, our job search workshops, job retention, some community resources, referring agencies, events, and, and things of that nature. Um, and how do you submit a referral? Um, so I will put the, the uh, website in the chat as well to where you would go to actually submit the referral. This is what it will look like here. You'll have to put in your work email. If you don't use your work email, it will not allow you to submit that referral. Um, and so it was also for a while, and it will again, it, once you submit the referral for your client, it will then um, generate an email that it will send out to the client for them to do a clothing questionnaire and a demographic intake right now. Um, our CRM is acting wonky as CRMs do. <laughs> and so it's asking for a, uh, a username and a password that nobody has. And we're in the midst of trying to fix that. So uh, if the client says, well, I got this email and I can't get into it, they'll still get an appointment and we'll just have them fill out that information when they come into their appointment. Um, this is the clothing questionnaire I'm talking about. Uh, Cause we do offer um, what a, a lot of people call it virtual. Uh, we call it here Dress for Success. We do offer a contactless appointment for people who can't make it in or they live far out like uh, in Salem and places like that, uh, where with this clothing questionnaire, our uh, personal shoppers will pick their items and then we'll mail it to them in the mail. Uh, so, but that is still an option. I will just fill out the clothing questionnaire for them over the phone. All right, and then... Uh, so this is the next step is just to start referring. Um, anybody have any questions for me? I have a question. Okay. I think it's great that you have contact less and you can, um, you know, get, get supplies to folks who live a ways away. What is your, um, what is your area that you serve? Uh, we serve the Multnomah County and surrounding areas um, pretty much as far as, I, I would say like Dallas, um, four or five hours more, the more rural areas. Uh, there's really no limit as long as they are in um, in Oregon and we're able to get a referral for them. All right. Thank you. It's awesome. All right. And I am going to stop sharing because that's all I have to share with y'all. Susan, right. did that answer your question? I'm I'm so I'm not from Portland in the Portland area, so I'm not necessarily aware or know all of the um the counties. Uh, but I knew I do know we go as far north as uh, Washington, like um Vancouver, and then we go as far south. I know so far as Dallas, I think is the name of it. I know I need to really <laughs> look at my. So I know Susan's from Southern Oregon. What yeah. could you serve uh, down to like all four corners of the state? Is that a, yeah. a possibility? Okay. That is a awesome. possibility. Um, if it takes about two weeks from the time um, that I get the referral for a contact list to me shipping it off to them. So it does, there is a little longer turnaround time from whether, uh, from um, the ones that are here and are coming in person that turnaround time. So from the time that I get the referral to me contacting uh, the client to schedule an appointment is usually um, 42 to 72 hours. But with the contactless ones, it does take a little, a little more time from the time that I get the referral to the time I'm shipping their, their um, package to them. And to answer Sherry's question here, how do you become a referring agency? You do have to do a member agency orientation. And let me go ahead and get that pulled up here so I can put it in the, uh, where you would sign up to do the member agency orientation. I'll put it in the chat here. Give me just a second. Um, it's only 30 minutes. It's, it's I do one once a month. It is virtual, so you don't have to come in. It's 30 minutes on a Monday morning. Um, but here is that link here. There we go. If 
right. Anybody, any other questions for me? I don't see the link. Oh, I just put it in there. Maybe, oh, because I sent it to the direct. Sorry, everyone. Let's try this. There we go. All right. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you all for your time. If nobody has any extra questions, I will put the slide deck as well in here. Um, so you can kind of go over it uh, in the in the in the chat so y'all can kind of go over it at your own leisure as well. Um, and if you have any questions, my email address is here. There you go. All right. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Any, Thank you. Any other questions before we we're a little ahead of schedule, so we do have time for questions if anybody has it. Yeah. All right. I don't see any, but you have. Well, thank you, everybody, for your time. I really appreciate right. it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Y'all have her uh, eaten also. Do feel free to reach out. And then I'll be sending the um, PowerPoint, PowerPoint, or not PowerPoint, the Canva presentation out in PDF file um, with the follow-up materials next week. So you will um, uh, have it that way as well. But um, it's great that the link is right there and you can click on that as well. So I believe I saw our presenters for the next presentation um, join us today. Callie and Julie, are you ready to present? Yes, I am. Oh, yep. And I see my colleague, Julie. Great. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And then Julie, as soon as you see it, feel free to take it away. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Julie Reeder, uh, and I'm here with Callie today. Um, and we are from the Medicaid Health Related Social Needs Team. I'm the Senior Policy Analyst for Nutrition, and Callie is the counterpart for housing. So today, I know we only have a little short time with you, so we're going to mainly focus on housing. And I just have a few general things to share with you first about the waiver and some of the eligibility. Um, so just some basic information. What are health-related social needs? I'm imagining that many of you are familiar with this, and I know some of you we've spoken before. I'm seeing a lot of campus basic needs folks here and Partners for Hunger Free Oregon and so forth. So I realize some of this may not be brand new information to you. So they're really social and economic needs that affect people's ability to stay healthy and well. And so what are the health-related social needs benefits that are offered under this particular Medicaid waiver? There are climate equipment supports, air conditioners and so forth, and air filters, heaters coming up for the winter, housing supports, which Callie is gonna go over in detail here, Outreach and engagement servers, services, so helping people either connect to this benefit or connect to other supported um, social or practical services. And coming in 2025 will be the health-related social needs nutrition benefit um, as well. So that will start with medically tailored meals in January um, for this piece. What's really, really important to understand is that there are some narrow eligibility criteria to be eligible for the waiver. And so number one, you have to be an Oregon Health Plan member to qualify. So you need to be on OHP. You have to qualify for one of our covered populations. And Callie will go over that more specifically um, to talk about what that is for housing but generally you need to be um, you know, coming out of jail or incarceration, um, have leaving residential mental health or substance use of treatment, treatment, homeless or at risk of, of houselessness per some strict definitions and so forth. Again, we'll, we'll move through that. Um, and then also meet some additional eligibility criteria depending on what the particular benefit is. So just to be really clear, this is not something that's available to all OHP members, but a narrow set based on different levels of eligibility. So that's really important to remember. And hopefully we'll be able to clarify that enough for housing today. Next up. Okay. 
So timeline, good news, a lot of this has already rolled out. So the climate benefit started in March, um, really took off during the summer, as you can imagine, for air conditioner and air filter requests. Also outreach and, gate and engagement, again, to connect people either with this benefit or to connect with other services rolled out as well. Housing is 13 days old now, for 13, 14 days old. Um, has has come to be and also some expansion of the outreach and engagement. And then again, in January, uh, the medically tailored meals part and the assessment with the registered dietitian uh, will roll out and then also some expansion of uh, coverage for young adults with special health care needs. Um, and we'll continue to evaluate and expand if possible. So sometimes we'll get asked, is this flex funds that you're talking about? How is this different than flex funds? And so there are some important differences. So HRS flex funds on the left, HRSN on the right. So big differences, flex funds are only available to CCO members. So if you're someone who's on open card or fee for service, that's not available to you with HRSN they're available to both CCO and open card members. Um, other really key piece here is that flex funds are not covered, you know, services, they're optional for CCOs to fill or request. Here with HRSN, if you meet all the eligibility criteria, these are covered services, right? There are denial and appeal um, procedures that come with them. So that's a significant difference. Um, the payment issue is also very different. So flex funds come out of the CCO uh, budget, where HRSN that we're talking about today is covered by the Oregon Health Plan um, and paid for with, you know, the state, for example. So there are some overlaps in examples. Um, there are some, you know, ways that you might be able to cobble things together, but they are really distinct. Uh, distinct funding sources have some distinct rules. Um, and so, you know, they're not interchangeable, if you will. Um, so you could do things like preschool, preschool tuition and those types of things with flex funds. I've had some people who needed shoes um, or those types of things could work well for flex funds as well. And I think Callie's gonna touch on this a little bit more with housing. Thanks, Callie. Yeah. Um, all right. I'm here to talk about the housing benefit, which, as Julie mentioned, went live November 1st. So we're two weeks in. Um, the goal of the housing benefit is to help people stay in their current housing um, and to prevent homelessness. So this is a preventative approach um, and is, yes, focused on supporting people to stay where they currently are. So HRSN housing has numerous benefits. One is uh, rent for up to six months, including past due amounts. Um, utility costs up to six months, including past due amounts. Um, set, uh, storage fees. Housing tenancy sustaining services. So that's also considered housing case management. And then medically necessary home accessibility or home, uh, mo uh, I'm sorry, home uh, modifications and remediation services. And within these were pretty specific. So they include ramp and grab bar installation, um, pest control, heavy duty cleaning. There's also the installation of blinds to prevent allergens and then related hotel costs if you need to stay in a different place um, while, while that's being done on the home. So eligibility for these services. So the eligibility for uh, rent assistance and tenancy services is the same. Um, these services can be authorized together or independently. Um, but the first kind of pillar is that in the OHP member must have what we're calling a housing clinical risk criteria. And they're listed here. Um, you'll notice that they're pretty broad um, and that's intentional. The idea is to kind of bring as many people to, to fall under these as we can. Um, we do have a housing eligibility guide on our website, and we'll get to that, which goes into a bit more depth on what this means. But 
Um, these are basically the, the clinical risk factors here. The second pillar of eligibility is that the individual must fall under the at-risk of homelessness covered population. And how that's defined, we've mapped our definition to the Department of Housing and Ur Urban Development. Um, the individual must have an income that is 30% or less than the area median income according to HUD's data by county. Um, and they must lack sufficient resources or support networks to prevent homelessness. Um, in addition, um, the third pillar of eligibility is that they need support staying in their current home. So unfortunately, at this time, we cannot move people to new housing or um, you know, uh, work with people who are currently experiencing homelessness. This is purely preventative. Um, and uh, as far as the home type goes, we need a lease or a written agreement with the landlord. So um, HRSN utilities assistance and storage fees um, have the same eligibility, but are only available to people who are also receiving HRSN rent assistance. So for the next um, HRSN housing um, a benefit, which are um, home modifications and remediation services, there's a slightly different kind of eligibility package. And um, I think it's just, I, I just want to acknowledge that this eligibility framework is pretty confusing. That's why we have an eligibility guide on our website because it's kind of different for different services. And um, so you will get that link um, in this presentation. Um, but the eligibility for home modifications and remediation services. First, the individual needs to have one of those clinical risk factors. These are the same. Second, and this is a bit different, needs to belong to any one of the HRSN covered populations except for homeless. Um, so uh, these, this is a list of all of the HRSN covered populations with the exception of the homeless population. So uh, this includes people who are being discharged from a behavioral health facility, people who are being released from incarceration, um, individuals who currently or previously were involved with Oregon's child welfare system, individuals transitioning to dual Medicaid and Medicare status, um, people who meet the at-risk of homelessness definition, which I went over on the previous slide, um, or young adults with healthcare, or I'm sorry, with special healthcare needs beginning in January. Um, and then the third pill pillar of eligibility for this is that the individual um, or the OHP member must need the home modification to help uh, prevent or treat their clinical risk factor. So, um, you know, if the individual, uh, let's say, has a hoarding disorder, and needs kind of deep cleaning, the hoarding disorder would fall under complex uh, behavioral health condition. And then the um, home remediation is deep cleaning or muck outs. So those two things are logically connected. You wouldn't install a ramp, for example, for that clinical risk factor. So there has to be kind of a logical connection between, between those two. And then um, the next criteria is that the landlord, we need landlord approval of the home modification or remediation um, before the work can begin. So how does one go about requesting these types of services? Depends a little bit, depending on whether the OHP member is part of a CCO or the open card program. You can find, so basically to start off the process, um, it, we, uh, we use what's called an HRSN request form. So these are on our website. We have the CCO version um, on our website for each CCO, and we also have the open card one on our website. Now, I just want to acknowledge that CCOs are required to also take the open card template. So if you download the open card template and submit it to a CCO, they're still required to take that. What this does is it basically kicks off the process and requests 
the CCO or the open card program to conduct an eligibility screening process for the person that you're that has submitted the form. So it kind of kicks off the process. The minimum information that's required is the individual's name, their contact information, and what service they're requesting. So they can also provide additional information about their eligibility, you know, like talking through if they're if they meet that um, at risk of homelessness income uh, criteria, for example, but they don't have to. At that this stage, they just need to fill out that minimum required information, goes to the CCO or the Open Card Program, and then those entities reach back out to the OHP member to um, collect additional documentation around eligibility. So that is kind of the kickoff of the process. Um, just to note, an OHP member can um, fill out this form by themselves. They can ask. Um, someone like a trusted community partner, such as yourselves, for support, um, or they can go to what we're calling HRSN service providers, which are community-based organizations, and in some cases, counties, um, to request support for um, filling out this, this form. I'm going to go to the next slide and hand it back over to Julie. Sure, since we know that our time with you is limited today and there are a lot of details about eligibility and, and the process, we wanted to share with you what kind of communications pieces that we have and also resources. So I'm going to say again, visit our waiver arch HRSN webpage, which is full of resources, fact sheets, the request form, links to the CCO request forms. It's all in approximately one place here. So right now there's primarily climate and housing material, but soon there will be nutrition material as well. And uh, next up, Kelly. Um, and again, look, look at all the offerings. And so we have a lot of things for general uh, provider resources. So we've got fact sheets, we've got forms, we've got information about what it takes to qualify to be a provider. We have links to things like the fee schedule, which, you know, how much would you get paid if you're going to be providing these services? And we also have a lot. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we also have a lot of benefit specific resources. So, you know, all about housing with a fact sheet. What is this eligibility framework in more detail that Kelly just went over? Um, we've got an FAQs. We've got a, a version of that income chart that Kelly mentioned about being 30% of AMI. What does that look like for each county? It's right there. Um, what kind of thing would you need to do? Landlord tenant verification. That's available as well. Um, and we have things for outreach and engagement. So this is really your sort of one-stop shop um, for all things waiver uh, to help supplement our time with you today. So we also have provider trainings. And so if you are interested in becoming a provider for health-related social needs services, we've got a lot of good things on YouTube um, to help you learn how to enroll as an HRSN service provider. I just used this with a group the other week, and I thought it was really a wonderful resource. You can also see past sessions about housing um, and different meetings as well. So uh, if you're just catching up, there's a lot for you as well. So, okay, thank you. And I know we have a story and we have a mice and rats comment in the chat. So if, mm -hmm. uh, questions that you have for us? I'll note, and Misha, I think, uh, I don't mean to call you out, but I think that Teresa did send you this PowerPoint in advance. Am I right on that? I actually don't have this version. I have the one that she did for another a meeting that I was a part of. So if you could send me this one, that okay. would be great. Thank great. you. Yes, I will send that to you. Um, that kind of Gabby, I think that responds to your question. All of these links in this in this presentation are live, so you'll be able to have them um, with this presentation. So we'll do that. Um, I also want to touch on, uh, I might be mispronouncing your name, but Cherie's question, how do we become a referring agency? Um, so I'll, maybe a little bit complex to describe, anyone can fill out the HRSN request form. So anyone can support someone in filling it out, 
or fill it out directly. Um, to get paid for that work, um, you need to work with the CCO um, or the Open Card program um, and enroll as a provider and the HRSN service provider webpage and the um, enrollment guide and the standalone module of enrolling as an HRSN provider, that, that's kind of where you would um, start. Um, oh, I'm sorry. So that was first address for success. Well, it applies. Uh, it's a, a question for this as well. So, <laughs> so hopefully that's okay. Um, any other question? A and question so about rats and mice, and then she's living. Yeah. In okay. Um, great. I know you're about maintaining housing and not moving people, but go ahead. Yeah. So Susan, um, I would say, um. Uh, so a couple of things, if, um, stuck in her home with her five male roommates. Okay. So, um, right now we can't support an individual to move, but if there is, um, pest control, that is not the responsibility of the landlord. And there's kind of a, a fair housing, um, tenant law that can help sort through that. This individual can request, um, pest control through HRSN home remediations. And what you would need to do, um, well, you don't have to check eligibility. That is the, up to the OHP members um, health plan. But if they meet, ha have a complex clinical risk factor, belong to one of these covered populations, um, they can fill out this HRSN request form with their name, um, their uh, contact information, the service they want, pest eradication, and any additional information around eligibility they wish to include and send it to their health plan. And we can, um, when we send the this PowerPoint um, to Misha, uh, the, the request form is linked in here. So um, uh, Asher, uh, your question, um, it is for uh, all, uh, well, it's for all eligible members under OHP. So not everyone in OHP will be eligible. Um, you know, we went through the, the, that eligibility criteria, but it's for um, all OHP members. Yeah, I'm also seeing Susan's, um, your response, that's really hard. Um, she can submit an HRSN request form if she meets the at risk of homelessness definition here, she can also request tenancy supports. And um, this gets a little confusing. We're focused on helping people stay in their current homes, but if someone is at risk of homelessness, is currently housed, they can request tenancy supports to help them um, negotiate and think through their current situation. So I would recommend filling out the HRSN request form, um, requesting tenancy supports and uh, home remediations. And if she has additional um, eligibility information, including that with the packet and sending it to her health plan. Any other questions? All right. Um, Misha will be sure to get this PowerPoint sent to you all and hopefully the links will be of use. Just want to flag, there was a housing deep dive session on our um, provider training site. Um, so it's in the past sessions and it uh, it's about an hour and a half and it goes over a lot of information. So. Thank you for sharing your time with us today. We appreciate it. Yes, thank you. And thank you for the work that you do. Thank you. All right, thank you so much.
appreciate you uh, coming in today and being able to cover. I know I uh, said it was a little bit last minute request for you, uh, but I um, thought the presentation was great. So thank you so much. Um, so we've got about five minutes left. Um, does anybody have anything that they'd like to ask about at this time? We can open the floor for questions or if anybody has an announcement or something that they'd like to provide on behalf of their program uh, or organization, this would be a good time for that as well. Does anybody have anything? Okay, I don't see anything right now. Um, I do remember being in a meeting not too long ago with two on one. I know we have some two on one folks here um, and there was some conversations around referrals for CCOs. So uh, my understanding is, is that folks can uh, contact two on one if they have questions about these benefits too and they will help um, send them to the right path for the referrals. Is there anybody on two on one that can speak to that? Um, in the last minute or so. All right. My understanding is I think that is de that depends on the CCO, um, but that anybody can contact two on one and they will help them. So that's my understanding of that. So I just want to throw that out there as well, because I know um, navigating a website can be complicated for folks. So uh, to answer the questions, yes, we will get you a copy of that presentation. So that'll go out with the follow-up material in about a week. Um, if you have questions in the meantime, though, you're welcome to reach out and I'll get you some links. And then the Canva presentation that Kiyomi did um, is actually available by link in the chat that you can utilize. Otherwise, I will get that PDF out with the information again next week. So, all right. Okay, thanks for that information. Jenny, Crossroads is also doing screenings for HRSN in Lynn County. Good to know. All right. Well, I think we can end the meeting a whole three minutes early. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we do have our regularly scheduled meeting in December, so nothing has changed there. Um, those of you who do attend our SNAP partner meetings, I'll let you know that we have rescheduled that meeting. Um, and so that meeting is going to be the first Thursday of the month, which is the 5th. Um, so we did reschedule that one due to the holidays this month and next month. So if you are interested in attending the SNAP partner meeting, that one did get rescheduled. If you didn't receive an email on that, um, please let me know and I will get that forwarded to you so that you can attend that rescheduled time. I'll put the link in chat again for anybody or my email for anybody who might need that. Um, otherwise... That concludes our meeting and um, you are welcome to exit or hang around if you have questions, I will stay online. <laughs>